such an honor and privilege to have your wisdom and to uh, have your guidance, John. So I'm so appreciative that you came here today um, to share your wisdom. So, John, would you like to come up? Welcome. If you can negotiate these steps, okay. <laughs> I wonder how long we can just sit here silently without something arising in the mind. How many of you are comfortable sitting silently? So simple, isn't it? And if this this room here is full of well, what's it full of? A space. <coughs> it's full of silence, isn't it? Into this silence we come and talk or play music or something, go, and the silence is ever present. And the silence is still, isn't it? There is movement within stillness. and sound within silence. Complication within complete simplicity. Chaos within peace. Where is there not peace? It's almost too simple, isn't it? Most of us find it difficult not to talk, just to be quiet. It's become such a habit, hasn't it? We're conditioned to talk, so do something, try to be something, put on some sort of an act. And yet it all takes place within this unchanging still, silent. We could introduce another word, presence. Presence. See, is it empty? Meaningless? Or is it actually substantial and full of meaning? The most meaningful thing there is. What else can we call it? Silence. 
stillness, space, peace, presence, How about fulfillment? Well, isn't it that which fills everything else? How about spirit? Indescribable, and yet forever with us. Are we not in it like fishes in the sea? Where would we be without it? <laughs> the invisible background, the substance from which everything arises, the all containing the everlasting arms, the eternal. And how many are there of it? How many silences are there? How many presences? Was it undivided? Isn't it interesting here in this room? So, so, so simply, we're sitting in this indivisible one, aren't we? Which unites us much closer than anything we can say. Even if we all hugged each other, you can't get closer than all being in this, can we? All being like in the bath together. The indivisible one. Presence, the presence of what? Let's stick our neck out, shall we, and say the presence of God. One. Where this whole compulsion to be a separate individual, to be me, to be something separate, different to other people, is sort of settles down, doesn't it? It's not forbidden, it's not, uh, um, it's just not so necessary perhaps as it was when you're not aware of this. When we're not at peace, then we feel we have to fill the space with something, something to express me. And what is me anyway? Is me really just that which feels separate? And where do problems arise? Are there any problems here? The only problem in this world is here, isn't it? In me. Am I right? Well, so that's why I'm a little bit uh, not too sure of the title of this talk, Peace Through Meditation. I suggest peace is even simpler. I don't think <laughs> peace needs anything at all, does it? Except just to talk, stop talking. <laughs> well, the trouble is we've, we've become... Well, no, let's develop it a little bit further. Because we live surrounded by a beautiful country springs taking place it's all taking place in this isn't it and the sheep are grazing in this and the fresh young grass is growing in this and the clouds are moving across the sky in this isn't it it's all contained the whole what we call nature and yet 
we tend to live in a world of separation with the emphasis on what we call self-expression and individuality and so on. Which is all right sometimes, but it can become a bit tedious, especially to other people. That is worse, it can become rather unpleasant, can't it? Erupt into arguments and things and even bores. It is all contained in peace, isn't it? In this over overarching peace, the peace of God that passes understanding. Because it's not something you can figure out in the mind, it's just here to be realized. As every creature in nature just does naturally. How can we ever be absent? And yet we are, aren't we? Isn't this the human condition, by and large, absent from the present? Hence our difficulties. Absence from the presence of God. And hence we are called to return, to reconnect. And how better can we reconnect than just being here and now? Feet on the floor, bottom on the chair, listen and look. Instantly one is brought to this presence. And if we really look and listen with full attention, the mind will be quiet because your attention is given to what's in front of you. And there's no need for a lot of paraphernalia to bring it about. The connection is instantaneous, direct. So I could uh, go back to the title of this talk and suggest there's no better meditation than Simple practice of feeling your feet on the ground, listen and look. There you are, my dears. So much for all the clutter. <laughs> Common sense. Hmm? Use your common sense, boys and girls. Listen and look. <clears throat> An extraordinary thing is that when you're at peace, you look out on the world and that's what you see, isn't it? When you're really at peace. Hmm? because all the disturbance, such as it is, is contained within this greater peace, isn't it? The peace, as it were, smiles down, and like children playing in a sandpit, you see the world playing itself out in peace, in perfect peace. And just as every leaf in the autumn falls from the tree and falls into its perfect place in the perfect order, determined by the wind and everything else. Isn't every grain of dust on the floor perfect in its location, in its situation, in its fulfillment of the purpose? Isn't every blink of the eye, every hair of your head counted, every thought in our minds partakers of this divine providence? Isn't it obvious? It's not something we have to learn, it's just before our eyes, isn't it? If only we are just present.
peace, unity. How about love? Where do any of these things end or begin? <clears throat> or do they all just merge into one? We start off with silence, we end up with God. How do we get there? Isn't it really the same thing? It's just a matter of deeper appreciation of what it is, deeper allowance of what's present. It takes a bit of practice, I grant you, because most of us are so agitated and absent in our minds, absent-minded, that, that we, can't, we can't straight away get it. And I suppose this is the practice of meditation, why right? it's a useful thing to do. I was lucky, I learned as a young man, I practiced all my life. Seems easy to me now. Usually when people start, a few minutes is as much as they can do. Well there, dears, I've, I've come to the end of my subject. What else can I say? If you, you could help me by maybe asking me what to say next, if it's of any help to you. Or <coughs> there's something I can elaborate on? Yes, dear. <coughs> yes, yes, indeed. Oh, that's a big subject here. In, 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 in the next room, there's two volumes of a big book called Mystic Forbearance, in which I... Uh, in which I elaborate on that question. Oh, perhaps that gives me something to talk about. Forbearance. Nice old-fashioned word, isn't it? Perhaps very appropriate in the world today. Forbearance. Forbearance. Patience. Forbearance. You see, I'm going to do this many times because we always, like a puppy, or a naughty puppy, we stray away, don't we? We won't walk at heel. And we need to be constantly be recorded, feet on the ground. How many of you are still doing that? We've all forgotten it, haven't we? Listen and look. Come back, my dears. Keep coming back here. And then all that I say will just flow and you'll understand it. If you just try to think about it, you'll lose the thread. It's very, very practical. It's realization. It's not learning, it's realization, bringing into reality. Now look, <clears throat> come back to being present. Find this silence. And the peace. Now this peace is universal, isn't it? It doesn't stop at the walls. It goes out, it embraces the whole town of Buxton, the whole countryside around, reaches up to the hills, beyond the hills, all the way to where you live. Where does it end, my dears? It goes all the way to Ukraine and embraces the whole world, doesn't it? It has no end. Now then. So whatever takes place in this world is actually in peace. Rather like your tummy can rumble. If you've got indigestion and it takes place in perfect peace, doesn't it? It's just a movement, it's just a natural phenomenon that takes place. Our legs can fidget and we can move around and it all takes place in perfect peace. And so it is. It's just a matter of extending to embrace more and more extreme conditions. Where does peace come from? Peace comes from peaceful people. People who are full of peace. It doesn't come from conferences and talking. It comes from peaceful people. 
Years and years ago, a long time ago, I also was in South America as a young man. I tried to make the world a better place. And after some success, but a lot of failure, I was sitting on a mountainside one day, and a little voice seemed to say to me, to make whole, be whole. Which was far too big a pill for me to understand as a young man. But I've been trying to understand it all my life. And actually what I'm talking about today is just this, isn't it? Come back to peace yourself. To universal peace. Universal love, if you like. And the immortality of spirit. I might come back to and dwell on this a little bit more. The immortality in spirit. When nothing dies, how can it die? Now, when we are permeated with this ourselves, where does it end? And conversely, you see, if we're not in there, if you're in a state of negativity, a state of denial, a state of absence, then that goes out, doesn't it? And don't use the word vibration. But I, sort of, <laughs> I know people do use it a lot, but I suppose in effect that's what it is, isn't it? Radiation of some sort. But we don't really need to understand the detail, do we? The principle of it is as simple as pi. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the tensions of this world, you know, see, when we're not fully here, when you're just sort of halfway there, then, uh, you know, mostly in this world, but also sort of getting glimpses of this, then, of course, we... We go through all sorts of intermediate performances and we're still in the world of trying to change and influence and, and negative and positivity and all this, this sort of goes on, sort of preliminary. So, but there is beyond that, there is this total oneness. So there's no need to change anything because there's nothing wrong, is there? There's nothing. It is perfect. God made the world and saw that it was good. But man has absented himself from the presence, fallen into separation, and because we're separate from the source of life, and of course we die, we enter into what's called mortality, and so we, the whole performance of trying to prolong life and <laughs> stop dying goes on, and so and so and so and so down to the world in which we're accustomed to live. And so from here, we're not too content. We're wanting to find something better. So with a bit of luck, we start the long, long process of climbing back up again to find, where, to find the source where it all comes from, which is our true nature, what I am. Because in that long sequence of stillness to silence to peace to presence to Whatever, how does it go next? Uh, you know, peace, love, it, it's spirit, that's right. It's what, actually, I am, isn't it? Before I am John or I am Gina or someone, it's just pure I am. Before all the covers have been added, all the extras, which, of course, fall away when we die. <laughs> Those of you who've, who've witnessed death know very well that Something goes and something's left behind, and there's what's left behind goes into the grave, and something merges back, goes back home. And this is called the great work the great work of work of. Finding our way home, first of all to peace, and then peace is the threshold of ever deeper adventures. In 
and the infinite. And it all starts here and now. We can never be closer to God than here and now. Can we? Yes, that, <coughs> sorry, I've wandered off, the, off your question, dear, a bit, but see, forbearance is a, is, a, is a great virtue because, you see, when you enter into judgment, criticism with the world, all you really do is pull yourself down into the duality, into the separation, and by criticizing somebody else, do the opposite of helping them. There's a much better judge than you and me. So forbearance is the most, you know, what we can't change, we must endure. And then even higher, one can begin to act in a rather more positive way. It's instead of criticizing, you love, love your enemies, as Jesus tells us. There's nobody that's not lovable, really. It depends what's in our eye, isn't it? The impure eye, of course, will see impurity. But the pure heart, everything is pure. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Wherever you look, Wherever you look, no qualification about it. You can see justice or injustice. You can see the law, or you can think you know better. What, what happens when the body is has a certain degree of poisoning, you've been doing bad things or something, or picked up infection or something, it bursts out in an ulcer or a boil or something, doesn't it? It's perfectly lawful. These things happen when the body reaches a point of discomfort with itself. So it is with the world, yeah. And so things arise in the world that people don't like. Yes, nothing happens without a reason. But what, the one thing one can be perfectly safe in saying, that it, the trouble always starts with me. You see, because the first, the first person who absents himself from the presence of the Father, if you like, the Heavenly Father, is me. And that's the first step in the slippery slope judging others, seeing bad, and right and wrong, and the whole issues of what's called duality or separation, which lies at the root of human troubles. And those of you that are lucky enough to have an effective way of meditation probably know as well as I do that when you can let that go and uh, so lush like a balloon, rise up into this space, which you can't describe because it's beyond description. 
And my dear, all that aggro goes out of it, doesn't it? And you even forget you've got a body. You begin to discover what might be meant by the kingdom of God. No sorrow, no sighing, and most certainly no death. <laughs> so if I don't die, neither well, does anybody else in reality. It's not as real as we think. It's simply a result of absence. Oh dear, I'm throwing some big stuff at you, so any of you want to protest or question or something? Or does it all make sense? Is it actually quite realizable and simple and common sense, really? If only we are present. Well, dear, forgive me, but everybody, nothing is not connected with God. Every ant, every blade of grass is, otherwise it wouldn't exist. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we don't all realize it. But, uh, <coughs> but uh, there, are, there are like... <coughs> There are certain paths. Everybody has an instinct to what they to what they want, to what they love. Well, if we follow that, we'll come home. We may take a few wrong turnings, get it wrong, but then we'll learn from mistakes and try again. That's all that's needed, dear. It's the, the, the last thing is it's always what can I do to help you? you see this is the ego getting in a way this is the separate separate me well this is the way that we live in this world this is the way the world functions and that's why it doesn't work very well much better to surrender and trust you see trust in the one who knows the one feature of man is that he doesn't know Man is ignorant, but of course he thinks he knows, which is the trouble. Anybody, that, beware of people who think they know, my dears. Anyone who thinks he knows, you can bet your boots he doesn't. Beware of clever people. Um, well, no, yes. Everybody wants love, don't they? To love and be loved is the universal cry, isn't it? And we start off by loving the football team or beer or something. It's okay. And then we might go on to something else. We are called. God calls us. Ooh, beauty, happiness. People want to sing, let them sing. There's a lot of people are attracted to that sort of thing. Some people like to be silent. It's all, it's all uh, indicative of the same call, you see. When I was first went to learn to meditate, I had a, had, they had a fill in a form at the school where I was, and 
One of the questions asked, what do you really want? You ask yourselves, what do you really in your heart want? What do you really, really want? Well, you just follow. Follow it. A lot of people say peace. Peace or love, freedom. As a young man, I thought I wanted freedom, among other things. I went off to South America like MJ there. Oh, I didn't know any better, did I? I came back and I learned to meditate. I remember my first time I meditated, I was sitting in St. Pancras Station waiting room late at night, waiting to get the late night train home. And I meditated and it all opened up like that. And I realized I didn't have to go to South America to find freedom, to sit on a mountain top. It was all within me. So, so we learn. No, I don't have to go and separate myself from this difficult world to find peace. In the middle of the marketplace, I'm perfectly happy, in perfect stillness, perfect peace. I can listen to the news on the radio and in perfect peace. I can hear of someone dying and inwardly, I know perfectly well that in presence no one dies at all. So light counters darkness. The powers of dark are only dark until the light shines. When you see the light, there is no more darkness. So it is there. <laughs> oh, I suppose we just do what we can, my dear. We can't become holier than we are. We've got to start from where we are. And um, it's a long, long process. That's why we're, perhaps why we're given 80-odd years of this life. <laughs> because because it's, like, it's like being in school. You can't uh, pass through all the classes in school until you're ready. You've got to graduate from each class and take your exams. So uh, comfort may... Uh, we may get bits of comfort along the way, <laughs> but it tends to come and go, doesn't it? But, uh, but um, with practice, practice, we may find more of it. Um, yes, it is a long process, dear. We, we can't grow up before we're ready. We're all little children. I'm still a little child, dear. Still a, uh, in, in infant school, in preparatory school. So we uh, have to go through all these different stages. I know it's ever so easy. When we're young, we read books and things and read, you know, pick up these words like uh, you know, spirit and the kingdom of God. Well, God itself, we talk about God like fish and chips, don't we? But nobody actually knows what God is, do they? Who knows what God is? Who's ever seen God? Hmm? I'll tell you a few more things. What about this silence? Who knows what silence is? Who knows? Hmm? Well, what silence? Or what stillness, dear? You can't describe it, can you? Who knows what peace is? Hmm? 
You feel it. Of course you do. You feel it, dear. But you can't describe it, can you? Nobody can. All the real things in life, you see, you can't describe. The moment you describe something, you bring it into the realm of separation, don't you? You bring it down from the universal, from the universal quality that it is, into it is or it isn't. That's why beware of description. Comfort. What did Jesus call the spirit? He said, I'll leave the spirit with you, which is the comforter. And isn't this so? Just feel it here. Whatever fools we make of us, ourselves in this performance, if we can take, reconnect with this, it means that there's a comfort, isn't there? A sort of benevolent kindness. It's all right, my dear, it's, you'll learn. <laughs> come back, come back here. Feet on the ground, like my granddad said to me. Come back here. Hmm? Yes. Lovely statement. I'm writing all your treasures here. And I'm thinking about peace coming from peaceful people, peaceful minds. Yes. However, the world is constantly at war yes. and we have war even in our relationships. Yes, yes, yes. So if peace comes from peaceful people, yes. Well, well, <coughs> well, sweetie, perhaps I shouldn't have said peace people, because actually peace comes from the peaceful. Let me just stop the sentence there, because actually peace is everywhere, isn't it? Peace of the hills, peace in the atmosphere. And this room is full of peace, isn't it? It doesn't have to be people, but of course we all, we're so people-orientated we tend to think this way. So peace comes from the peaceful, which is the universe. And if any of us are lucky enough to have accumulated some in our hearts, well, well, that's a bonus. Well, darling, it's, it's, look, think of a balance, dear. Bad on one side and good on the other. Or peace on one side and the opposite of peace on the other. You've got to keep on building the balance. And when you've got more peace in you than than disturbance, and then keep on building it, and then gradually the balance will tip. But until that happens, then of course you'll be, uh, if you're a, of a restless temperament, you'll be agitated and restless. But well, that might give you the, the motive to try and practice peace then. It might just be a matter of going out in the park, or taking the dog for a walk. Oh, thank you very much. I said, it, it's not so much me, dearie. The fact is that <laughs> one of the advantages of getting old is that you die out of me. <laughs> and as you die out of this, then you die more into this. You see? And this, of course, is peaceful, isn't it? And of course, I've been practicing. I started as a young man of 26. I, nearly 60 years I've practiced meditation, and that helps. Because it's rather similar to dying in, with meditation. Because when you meditate, those of you that don't know much about it, you really just let go. And, uh, and just like a balloon, just like a balloon lets go of the weights and you go up. And... and uh, and as you go up, just like a, well, you know what it's like in an aeroplane, don't you? You go up through the, through the go to the airport, you go up, and you go through clouds, don't you? And when you go beyond clouds, what's the clouds? What's beyond the clouds? Hmm? The beautiful open sky, isn't it? So it is with us. All our restlessness, you see, is in the mind. It's just clouds. And meditation, just like an aeroplane, you just go through the clouds, then you find the peace that's beyond the infinite. It's dead simple, really. 
Well, it seems complicated as we start, and then you get the hang of it. And like anything, dear, practice makes perfect, and you just you get the first little glimpses of it, of course. It's a lifetime's process. I tell you, I'm still learning. Well, it depends. It depends how deeply grounded you are. Dear. Um, if if you're really deep, if you're really at one, first of all, there is no thought. There's no thought at all. And uh, an evil. What is evil, dear? Something that wants to harm. What happens? What happens to the dark when we turn on the light? There is no evil. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. There is no dark. The world is, is the reality. Is perfection. It's undivided. Absolute completion. Oh. You can even just feel it here. But you see, we don't want to we hang on. But, 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 what about evil, you see? And so we hang on. It takes a lot of work and determination, dear, to gradually, gradually, gradually let go. The only evil, dear, is held in here. It's the, it's the negative feelings in our own minds. And this is the, the work to overcome. Yes, I know I could sort of chatter away in a jocular fashion. Ha, 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 there is no evil. But I assure you, for most of us, most of our life, we're very much in the dark. This is what, if you're religious, is called sin. This is the uh, absence from the presence of God, absence from paradise, which is which is man's original and state. You don't believe me, I can see that, because you're trying to think about it. And uh, of course, as long as we think, but what about evil, that thought will predominate in our minds, and it will be a reality. Uh, would you be kind enough to slip uh, and bring me an icon of St. George? Mm. You may remember the, uh, the well-known icon of St. George, the picture of St. George and the dragon. You won't see it very clearly, but... See, here is, the, here is evil, here is the dragon. By the way, <coughs> consider that in English, E-V-I-L, evil, is the opposite of L-I-V-E, isn't it? The opposite of lie. <coughs> Interesting point, isn't it? Well, here we have the dragon. Hmm? And here we have St. George on his horse, his white horse, as it were, just dancing over it, isn't he? Hmm? And, and you won't be able to see St. George. Very often in the West, his, um, he's depicted as a muscular soldier-like figure with a sword slaying the poor dragon and blood all over the place. But this icon is, is a Russian icon. And talk about Russia. One of the things Russia has is a very uh, deep spirituality. Um, they take it much more seriously than we tend to do. And St. George is depicted with an absolutely calm face, serene. And of course, there's God in the top corner, connected with the presence of God. He's in the presence of God. And his weapon is not a military weapon, it's a shaft of consciousness. Hmm? It just looks there. You're just a dragon. And the dragons where dragons belong, down on the ground. A darkness, a shadow. Who doesn't have a shadow? 
We don't worry about our shadows, do we? So that's right. Why don't we get frightened of our dragons, of our shadows? There he is. You're just a power of darkness. And you see the, all the heat's taken out of it. And so evil is overcome. Remember the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount, resist not evil. The more you resist it, you give credence to it, don't you? And it gets bigger. The more the media and the whole world goes mad about this war in Ukraine, the bigger it gets. Hmm? You're feeding the darkness, wallowing in it like a pig in muck. And this is what we do. This is one of the perversities of man. In a perverted way, we love our suffering. We just wallow in it. Well, maybe just practice, then. Just practice. Put it into practice. The being peace. Feet on the ground. Listen and look. So then whatever is coming, because again, I'm thinking, we've all just come through the, the COVID situation as well, when many people felt forced into making decisions they didn't want to, or frightened. What I feel you're saying, I just want to make sure I'm hearing it, is the more we resist anything, the more we create the disturbance and the, the absence of peace. So, are we learning at this stage in humanity to really recognise the power of, of source of peace within to be bigger than the darkness? I think I'm answering that question. <laughs> It's a long process. It takes time. Some of you may know I was a farmer. That's been my, that's my, my job as two member active years. I suppose just that observation of uh, cause and effect. A lot of it you don't understand. Why do things go wrong? Why do crops get diseased? Animals die? Things happen, don't they? Some we understand, most we don't understand. I remember it was, science was really only beginning when I was a young man and, uh, and people were talking about uh, the soil as though they understood it, you know. And the more I worked with soil, the more I realized how unbelievably subtle and complex it is. And uh, the efforts of science to understand it seemed quite grotesque, really. And how the world tries to understand what happens in the world and clever 
people comment on it and politicians try to choose what the right thing to do. No, none of us really know, do we? Eventually, I learned, I learned to trust nature more, myself less. I think that's probably the most important thing, you trust yourself less. It's this, this in inflated ego, our own self-righteousness, that is such a demonic thing that we know in the process of life is teaching us we don't know. Wisdom is when you don't know anything, dear. I didn't always embarrassed when people talk of me being wise, dear. I'm not. That's the last thing I lay claim to being. Yes, I'm very suspicious of, uh, of knowing. It's much safer not to know. And here brings me on to another very important point, is humility. There's nothing more important in this world than to be humble. And that puts you in the right place, you see, in this question that you're asking. Approach life with a humble, in humility, and you're likely to make less mistakes. There's safety in humility. There isn't much safety in anything else. Put not your trust in man or any child of man. Trust this. Here and now, darlings, this is the only thing that hasn't changed throughout this talk, has it? It's here as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. Isn't it true? What else can you trust? Really, truly. Even the mountains rise and fall, let alone civilizations, the fashions of man. And you know, when you're humble, just coming back here, Feet on the ground, bottom on the chair, into thy hands, O Lord. And then comes the comfort, doesn't it? The peace and the comfort. The everlasting arms that hold not only you and me, but all the poor people who are going, and animals, everything, dear. Every blade of grass trampled on by clumsy feet is held in this unshakable, unchangeable love of God. And isn't it love? You can feel it for yourself, can't you? It's not, I love you, that comes as a byproduct. It's actually, we are in love. This is the whole world, my dears. And suffering is just part of the great process. We all have suffered in our lives, one thing and another, God knows. Who hasn't gone through their life without pain and suffering? Some die early, some live long. But in the great love of God, how can anyone die? That's the reality, isn't it? It's an appearance. It's peace.